looking around, I finally see I think I need a change. The rat race I want to flee, my world I'll rearrange. I'm getting back to the roots of how it's meant to be. Growing gardens, picking fruit, racing livestock, living free. Hello and welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. I'm your host, Harold Thornbro. And I'm your host, Rachel Jameson. <laughs> welcome, everyone. Uh, glad you're joining us today. Um, today, we're going to talk about homestead tool maintenance, repair, and organizing. Kind of a general, I don't really know how to really put it. We're going to cover lots of things on those um, in those areas, but uh, something that I work at, sometimes struggle at. I don't know about you, Rachel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. A lot. Yeah. Before we jump into that, though, how's things going on the old homestead? Well, they're going pretty good. We're, we've are we been preserving a deer that, we, that the hubby got on opening day, and we let hang for a while. Well, congratulations. Yeah. I'm happy for you guys and a little jealous. Um, <laughs> I... I've been so, I hear, I said this year, I'm going to get out. I'm going to do a lot more hunting. I've only been out a couple of times and I, I just haven't been getting myself out there. I need to get out there. I don't know what's wrong with me. When does was, your hunting season end? Well, we got, I mean, if I'm hunting bow, I, there's the late archery. It goes into okay. January. So I still got plenty of time, okay. but yeah. Um, yeah, I might end up <laughs> doing more hunting in the late archery season. Uh, Cause generally the woods are just empty at that time. Cause it's so cold out. Yeah. Nobody's going hunting. But I actually like it. I I actually like hunting in that time. I love it when there's just a lot of snow on the ground and and uh, you can. It's just cold. I I just enjoy hunting at that time of the year. But uh, most people don't. So <laughs> it's a lot more peaceful in the woods during bow season. It, that's for sure. It is. It is. Yeah, the late archery is a lot more peaceful. And there's just, like I said, there's nobody out there. Then everybody's done, did their thing, and they've got out of it. But so are you guys uh, freezing, canning? How are you, how are you doing this? Um, the freezer is full, so (laughs) I have, um, I probably have 15 pounds of venison roast curing and, uh, for corn, corned venison. Oh, wow. And then we did probably about 10 pounds for beef jerky and, um, I'm going to cube up the rest and can it. Nice. Yeah. Was it a decent, decent sized deer? It was, I should weigh it. It was a really big bodied buck. And it was the healthiest buck that we have seen in a long time. Um, My husband had been hunting at a friend's property and there's a lot of corn and soy and it's just closer to town. And I Mm -hmm. think the deer there, they were still healthy, but they would have a lot of ticks on them. Mm -hmm. I mean, just embedded in their fur. And this one we actually got out at our property and um, it, There's lots more swamps and it's much more rural. And Mm -hmm. so I think this deer was probably eating more of a natural diet that deer are supposed to eat. And we didn't find any ticks on it. And oh wow. Um the inside organs were just they're they were beautiful. Of course, we eat the organs. So the liver was just beautiful. It was the best liver I've seen in a long time. Sometimes the last few we had seen had I mean, they weren't bad. There was no worms or anything in them, but they just had um they just like weren't that beautiful a do- color. A dollar, yeah, like the lighter dollar color. Yeah, I know what you're yeah, talking about. Yeah, they didn't you... have that beautiful color. They had maybe yeah. a little bit too much fat in them. Mm-hmm. Um, this one, it was just, it was just beautiful. It nice. Was, yeah. So, and there was no ticks. We didn't see any ticks, which is, it, um, you know, kind of controversial. But did he get it on uh, Thanksgiving Day? No, he got an opening day. <laughs> oh, okay. In the morning. He texted me like, I forget. It was maybe like 10 o'clock. Oh, I got one. And I'm like, wow, that was fast. Nice. Yeah, and he was nice, of course. Of course, um, we hunt for food. And so we're not going after trophies. And mm-hmm. if, you know, but he was very, he's always also very happy when it has horns. So <laughs> this one was a really nice eight point. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Well, congratulations yeah. to him. So we That's might try great. to do for fun. We might try to do a European mount, which is where you, it's just the skull, not, um, yeah, yeah. You know, not the 
what right. do you call it? With the fur and everything left on, yeah, you basically right. boil everything away. Yeah. And it's just, yeah. And I yeah. really, I'm kind of excited to try that. that yeah, that would be neat. Uh, I had the, the last episode, I had the Homesteaders of Indiana on and then the lady i was interviewing there brooke her husband and i think had already gotten three deer and i was like oh, wow. oh i'm so jealous wow. <laughs> i think that's what she said they'd been out we was talking before the show started she said they're doing a lot of processing of deer right now and i was like wow three that's that's a, that's lot. a lot that's amazing yeah. in here i haven't even uh got a chance to see one yet <laughs> when i the couple times i went out <laughs> yeah so i am if anybody wants to email us or email me um I am looking for recipes for the tenderloin. I've never mm. really, this one had beautiful because it was a bigger buck. So it's got some very light, nice um, tenderloin. And I've really never done a lot with those. So if anybody has some good recipes or anything, I'm looking, I don't really want to cure those and I don't want to can them because, you know, it's the tenderloin. <laughs> yeah. With it, when it comes to tenderloin, I honestly, I don't even like doing anything with it. I like to use salt and. Uh, really? Yeah. Throw it in a cast iron skillet and i mean i slice it up and you know nice little uh medallion cuts so yeah just i mean that to me and I, I could just eat those year round that's my favorite absolute favorite to eat right there nice but yeah i don't want to do anything else with it my wife will talk about you know putting some kind of marinade on them or something i'm like don't you touch that <laughs> that's perfect the way it is because <laughs> she right, has exactly. to she has to marinate she really doesn't really like deer meat that much but she will marinate it and she'll eat it but it has to be some kind of marinade or a lot of okay, extra yeah. something she she just picks up on that little bit of gaminess and it bugs her right. which me i don't mind it i love it and um, i suspect this one will be more gamey because yeah. our property has some swamp and i suspect it was probably eating a lot of that like bark and mm -hmm. where the yeah. where where we had hunted before they were probably getting a lot of like corn and stuff because it was cornfields but um if you're not sensitive to it you probably wouldn't even notice when it, we though. first got yeah. married which was almost 30 years ago I, we had i had never ate wild game because you know i was kind of a city girl and my dad grew up eating tons of wild game because his my grandpa was a dnr yeah. officer so he got lots of wild game oh yeah and my dad got burned out on it and didn't want anything to do with it and so <laughs> i never had had it and when we first got married i was like this is the nastiest what is this yeah but now we're it's just kind of become part of it we've it, gotten used to it it's kind of funny because uh, i think of the meats i eat the most of course everybody eats a lot of beef and pig and you know chicken but i eat obviously a lot of rabbit and quail because we raise a lot of that throughout the year but then i would say the next meat i eat the most of is probably squirrel meat we oh. i mean because i shoot a lot of squirrels every year i mean you i go out squirrel start eating it again we were eating a lot. a lot of it when we first got yeah. married and we were Poor, poor, poor. Yeah. We ate a lot of squirrel. I like it. You just got to know how to cook it to where it's tender and it's really good. It's one of my favorite meats, though. It's up there in a, a you know, top five or six anyway. <laughs> you know, huh. I like all kinds, but I eat a lot of squirrel meat. But yeah, deer is, a, you know, something that um, the family will eat. Like I said, it just depends on how it's cooked, how it's prepared. You know, everybody will eat it and enjoy it. Right. But yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good stuff. And and my 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 little indoor garden. I think I talked about that last week. My mm -hmm. microgreens are up and rolling, so we've been kind of munching on those. I'm but. still still not starting those yet. I need to get well, with it. I you have, like it, but, but you have your greenhouse. So tell I am. Us how and that's well, going. I it, it's growing good. Nothing's ready to eat yet. Uh, everything's up though. Everything's doing good. Things are like. I mean, I could if I wanted to eat it in like a microgreen state, but I'm looking to grow more full plants and the uh that system um but the lettuce is almost ready i have some lettuce actually growing in some pots in there and that is almost ready to pick uh so i could definitely harvest from that probably this week and start start eating some of that um i told you my cherry tomato plant bit the dust yes. last week when it got really cold well it was funny because about half of it turned brown and i went ahead and just picked all the cherry tomatoes off there's quite a few on there i mean there was a dozen or so on there so i didn't do anything with it i just left it and the half that didn't die started popping out all these cherry tomatoes. So I got like probably nice. 20 more cherry tomatoes off of it. So I don't know what happened there. I don't know the stress. You know how a plant, when it gets kind of stressed, it'll just kind of go into survival mode, just start putting off a lot of fruit and seed and ripening everything because it starts preparing to produce right. it, reproduce itself. And I think that's what it did. It just went into this state where it just started popping out all these cherry tomatoes. And it was kind of funny. But yeah, it put off a whole nice. bunch. It's probably officially done now, though, I would say. But Maybe. yeah, then that huh? got out, uh, see, middle of the last week and 
uh, every year I just, I cut, I coppice my mulberry trees. And I mean, when I say coppice them, I take them to about a foot tall. Okay. You know, I take them right pretty close to the ground. And one of them's really big. One of them gets about 25 feet tall in a year, which blows my mind how tall it gets. It is mind blowing how fast those. Yeah, grow. they they are. It, that one is, really does blow my mind. It's it grows so fast and gets so bushy and big that it's amazing. And I probably wouldn't even mess with it at this point and coppice it. But where it's at, there's actually power lines above it, and I try to keep it out of this power because it reaches right. them every year, and I cut it almost to the ground every year, and it reaches to those power lines every year. So I try to keep it down. But yeah, I went out and did that and got a lot of a uh, lot of wood from that. So so do you um, get fruit off of that them when you coppice them or no? I do not. Uh, okay. They just produce a lot of leaves and 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 limbs and and. I, that one particularly is the one I planted outside of where I keep my rabbits generally in their okay. cages. So I had it there just for that purpose, just to give right. them small branches and leaves. Um, but I, I think next year I'm going to do more of a tree hay setup with that tree and I'm going to coppice it mid or pollard it midsummer mm, when it's okay. full of leaves and try to put up a lot of those, um, those branches with leaves on them. And try to save those into the winter. And I'm going to really focus on that, I think, with the mulberry trees next year. The rabbits, will the rabbits eat some of the smaller branches too? Not yeah, just they, the leaves? They love like the, the branches. Wood. Yeah, yeah I, I, I I'll stick, you know, pinky size sticks in there and they just, they eat them con- entirely. Yeah, they love them. They love the bark. Wow, and, that's yeah, cool. They, that's they really fun. chew them up good. They, it's one of their favorites. So, yeah. that's now, was that, that was a, a wild one or did you purchase that tree no it it's a, a wild one actually i it, one? Okay. the neighbors about three houses down uh it they have a huge like one of the biggest mulberry trees i've ever seen so you just get them popping up everywhere yep that's and how, uh, it's, that's what our the yeah. ones that we have in our yard here that's what those are our yep. neighbor has a tree that popped up from probably somebody else's yard yeah and then they started popping up in our yard. So we dug them up, placed them where we yep. wanted them. But now we're like finding other babies that were just yeah. like, what do we do with all these? But Gener- um, I've yeah. planted three of them on the property, and but I transplanted them from right. where they were yeah. popped up, they popped up wherever. And yeah. I just moved them. And uh, yeah, and they're growing really, really good where they're at. And yeah, they put off um, only, uh, yeah, only one of them actually gives me berries, which is you know, but there are male and female right, yeah. mulberry trees. But the one I don't care. I wish the other one did. I kind of planted it where I planted it, hoping it would give me berries. But it, yeah. it, it it's a couple years old now, and it's not produced any berries, so I don't we think have, it will. Out at our property, those ones were hybrid mulberry, mulberries mm-hmm. that we actually purchased. But these ones, and then I bought, I did buy one ever bearing mulberry for the orchard. Yeah. The other ones were hybrids that I bought for coppicing and pollarding. But the ones we have here at the house are all. The wild ones. Have and, you um, ever seen those? Um, I think they're called Pakistan mulberry trees. They got like uh-uh. super long mulberries, probably mm-hmm. like six, five, six inches long. I mean, from the pictures I've seen, they look like they're probably four to six inches long. Really super long mulberries. I think they're I think they're called Pakistan, Pakistani wonder, mulberries or um, something like that. They probably wouldn't survive here. because it's. I don't know about Michigan. I think I think they will in Indiana. Uh Maybe they will. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, they look really interesting. I, I I thought about ordering one of those just to yeah. give it a try. I love I love mulberries. In fact, every year, yeah. the only thing I don't like about them is um, they're messy. <laughs> yeah. Well, like I did a I did a whole podcast episode on mulberry trees one time, and and yeah. there are pros and cons to mulberries, and you yes, do not to plant one where you're going to be parking your car or anywhere close to where you're right. going to be parking your car because it will make you hate the tree, and and well, a lot of people despise mulberry for that reason. Yeah. Well, and that's exactly what happened. The mulberries yeah. that I the mulberry trees that came into our yard are from the neighbor's tree, mm-hmm. and that is right over our driveway. Yeah. So the birds eat them, and then perp, perp, yep. poop, yep. purple poop onto the car, our cars. <laughs> yep. And then, everywhere. of course, they completely trash the driveway all mm-hmm. summer long. But, yep. There's yep. a place for them, like everything. It's just proper yeah. design and, and putting them where you want to put them. And, and then, yeah, like I said, it's one of my favorite fruits. I love yep. mulberries. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'll eat them to where I'm almost sick. And the whole thing you know? is edible. Yeah. 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 So they're a great tree to have if you have them in the right place. The right yeah. <laughs> right. I'm thinking that I'm hoping that once mine actually produce fruit, that the neighbor <laughs> maybe cuts theirs down. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, my neighbor's down the street. It's the biggest mulberry tree I've ever seen. Wow. You'd think this thing was like a... 
I don't know. It's it's the size of a like I would think an oak tree or something. I mean, this thing is oh, gigantic. Wow. I mean, it's it is. I've been around mulberry trees all my life. It's I've never seen one as big as this one. That's crazy. So I don't know how old it is. I'd be curious to to kind of maybe figure out how to determine the age of a mulberry tree and and kind of figure out how old that thing is because it's got to be one of the oldest ones I've ever seen. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. We used to have one when I was a kid that we would climb and eat, yeah. but I don't. As a kid, I would climb it and it felt big, but I don't think it was huge like an oak tree. Yeah, it was just this, really big. But I don't monsters. know where the you know the song around the mulberry bush came from because I've yet to see a mulberry bush. They usually turn into trees. <laughs> it's how you. It's really how you how you cut them. Like yeah. the one that yeah. we the one that I cut down every year. It's it's as wide as a bush. Now it has a single stump, but mm-hmm. it because I cut it so low, it just pops up in several you know uh yeah sprouts every year around kind of off that bottom stump and um yeah it's really wide i mean it's probably i don't know i'm gonna guess as soon by the time it gets six foot tall it's probably over 10 feet wide at that point yeah ours i will mean do the, the more i cut the top yeah. off the more bushy it yeah yeah get. yeah yeah we try to cut the bottoms up just so we can mow around it easier but yep. yeah Yep. Yeah, so I like having them, but yeah, that, that was my week on the homestead. Not a lot of, not a lot of interesting updates, but you know. Yeah, same here, but it was Thanksgiving week. <laughs> Thanksgiving so, week. Yeah. yeah. We're doing, we, we always gotta be, I feel like we always gotta tell people, yeah, we record these a week ahead. So yeah, that you're hearing this a couple weeks after Thanksgiving, but yeah, yeah last oh, week yeah. was Thanksgiving here. So <clears throat> yeah, busy week, lots going on for yep. sure. I did lots and lots of cooking this week. And then of course I have a uh, broth in my big roaster pan from my turkey mm-hmm. going right now that I'll can and turkey to can and venison to can. Apparently I'm canning a lot this week. Yeah. You started right back up again with the, the busyness of all that. Didn't you? Wow. <laughs> it's, it's like that fall season where you just do that a lot. And then December to, you know, February is a little bit slower, well, which brings us into the topic. Yeah, today, there you go. I mean, do, when things um, do slow down, we can yeah. focus on this, which is homestead tool maintenance, repair, and organizing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, when I start thinking about getting stuff in order, which I will admit, I generally, this isn't so seasonable for me, I seasonally. It's more of a year-round thing for me, but I think wintertime is a great time. The slow times are a great time to really focus on it. Make sure you got all your ducks in a row. Get everything kind of taken care of. And uh, maybe I need to do a better job of that <laughs> when it is slow. Um, because like I said, I do it throughout the year a lot when I probably don't have time to do it. And it it seems like I kind of overwhelm myself with things going on. When if I probably did just take the time when it's really slow in the wintertime, um, it would be better year round for me to do that. Um, but a lot of services and stuff, if you're using equipment a lot, you have to do that kind of year round anyway if you're using you know a piece of equipment or whatever that needs routine maintenance and service you you kind of have to do that when it's due you you can't just necessarily wait to winter on some of that stuff but that being said it's a great time to clean tools up Uh, together your stuff up if you got a garage or whatever get them in there get things cleaned up uh ready for the next year all your equipment all your tools keeping your tools clean will help them last longer um will make them uh, work better Uh, for sure. Um, Especially if you're starting to take on rust, uh, cleaning rust and stuff off of them. Well, and even like the sharpening and stuff like that of the tools that we're going to talk about, it helps you physically because gardening and homesteading can be physically demanding. But if you have the tools working properly, you're going to not be killing yourself to make that hoe Cut those weeds down if it's actually sharp and stuff like that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But yeah. and I don't know. We're modern homesteaders. You know, we have lots of power equipment, lots yep. of power equipment. So I mean, there's there's rototillers, there's lawn mowers, there's uh, you know your trimmers, your chainsaws, your chipper shredders. You have a tractor. I mean, there's yeah. a lot. There's a lot going on. You have a lot of mechanical equipment that needs you know oil changes, spark plugs. You need to grease it. Belt replacements, hose replacements, bearing maintenance. You you was telling me about how your tractor's uh, blowing O rings uh, quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the implements. I think it's because our property is quite hilly and bumpy, and we've mm-hmm. been cleaning logs and stuff up with it. So the tractor's moving a lot. But we started just keeping several O rings with us 
Yeah. Like, I think my husband even keeps them like on the tractor at this point now because otherwise <laughs> that you're bad, blowing huh? hydraulic. Wow. Well, you're just, we don't want the hydraulic fluid leaking off. Right. Over. Yeah. That's yeah, not healthy on your for the soil. Right. So, yeah. So, I mean, if he notices it's leaking too much, he'll replace that. He's got pretty handy learning doing that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, in most of this stuff, you could wait till till you're not using it in the wintertime right. and, and do a lot of this maintenance. Like, I don't touch my lawnmower through the summer. I mean, I just use right, it. Yeah. But then I, you know, bef- sometime through the winter, I will go ahead and change the spark plug and, and yeah. change the oil in it, get it ready to go. Do the same thing Definitely. with a rototiller before spurring. I'll go ahead and get yep. it ready if I'm going to use a rototiller that year. Chainsaws. Now, I'll be using them in early winter but then at some point in the winter i'll stop you know we're done cutting things with the chainsaw unless you get a nice storm or something that's going to bring down some trees or something you might need it so i'll make sure i've got a bunch of extra chains and i'll get all them sharpened up get the get the chainsaws cleaned up spark plug change get everything good on them you know uh, ready to go um the chipper now this was the first year i actually got a gas powered chipper shredder Okay. So that'll be something you'll know, be maintaining this winter and go ahead and change oil in it and tune it up and get it ready to go. Um, you know, just those mm-hmm. kind of things, you know, I mean, just stuff you're going to use in the next year, get it ready to go. And it's a good time to do that. Uh, when it's just the downtime, it's a slow time, you know, when you don't have time to do those things, uh, you know, you, you won't quite right, honestly, right. you just won't and things won't last as long and things are going to wear out right. and you're going to end up having a repair rather than just a service. So it's just yeah, better to do that ahead of time. It's, it is better because you also end up having tools in working order when you need them. And there's nothing worse than you have a certain amount of time to oh. get something done and then having a tool. Well, they're going to break anyways, but yeah. not having it maintained well makes it more right. likely to break. And it's just nice to reach in there in the spring when you're trying to get your garden in and have those tools ready to go. Absolutely. Because for us up here, our season is short. and you have, I literally usually have like a couple of weeks between mm-hmm. our last frost and when we don't have snow to plant stuff. Yeah, so, a friend of mine. I mean, every it yeah. seems like every spring. I, I know I've talked to him before, and he's like, "Oh, I was going to do some because he he does rototills his entire garden. He does market gardening actually. He sets up the, at the farmer's market. He's got a real nice rototiller, and it was just this this last spring he I he had to send his rototiller off to get it fixed because he's not a mechanical guy. He really didn't know right. a lot about it right when he needed to be rototilling, you know, and yeah. getting stuff in the ground. Yeah. He had to send it off to get it repaired. And I think it was down all winter and he just didn't get around to it. And then he was okay. like, Oh, yeah. and I, mean, I forgot, you know, and, and had to do it. And, uh, and it's not like those things won't happen, but yeah, right. if we do everything we can to avoid it, it's better. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah. you know, there's also beyond the, the power equipment, you know, that's just basic maintenance. It's just things you have to do, but I like to take the time to actually take care of my hand tools, like my axes, my hammers, yeah. you know, things like that. Especially a lot of my tools have wooden handles. Right. And wooden handles need a little bit of care. I mean, they will last several years without any care, but they will last a lot longer. I mean, you can hand them down to your grandkids if you yeah. got if you take care of them properly. In some cases, axes sometimes not. Depending on how good you are with an axe, you can tend to crack a handle or whatever here and there. But uh, you know, if they just get dry, they're more they're more apt to do that to crack and break and right. get yes. loose. If they dry out, they get too loose or whatever. Um, so I do treat. I don't probably do it every year, but every two to three years, I'm usually doing the linseed oil treatment on them. I do. There's other things you can use. Now there's two different, there's actually, I think three different kinds of linseed oil. You can use the raw, you can use the boiled. And then there's like a, I can't think of the other one. There's one that's actually like boiled. It's, it's a high heat treatment, but it's actually, and I don't even know, I need to look into it because. It's really super fast drying, like the boiled. That's the reason you would want boiled over right. the raw, is it dries a lot faster than the raw. Which is safer. But it yeah. also, uh, they have a chemical process that they do with it, and it actually gets metallic ki- uh, stuff in the linseed oil and the boiled ones. I oh. don't know if you knew that. So uh-huh. there's actually some, there's actually some reasons you might not want to use boiled right because yes. if people who are just super sensitive to, to any kind of a chemical process or whatever it could or they're worried about it whether they should right. be or not exactly. i don't know but again boiled dries way way faster i have used both and it, it's 20 times faster on the drying and curing um because it could take months 
uh, three or four months sometimes for raw. It depends on the temperature really? and how much good airflow you have. If I if you do it in a cold barn or whatever and leave it set. Oh, it's going it, to stay forever. Yeah. Yeah, it can like three months before it cures. Three, four months wow. before it cures. So uh, I always put them in a room that's a little bit warmer and let them dry if I'm doing it, if I'm using raw. Um, there is another one, like I said, that that is high heat, uh, but they do it under pressure. Okay. I can't remember what that one's called. Poly something. I can't remember exactly. I, I feel bad for not looking this up, but it, and it's actually safe. It's the high heat boil, and so it oh, dries oh, quick, so but it safer. but it doesn't okay. use the chemical process because okay. they do it with like a pressure. They they were able to raise the heat, keep it fireproof basically by putting it under like pressure uh, to get a high oh, heat. That's- that's good to know. Yeah, that, so that, that's the one of the da- that's one of the issues with it. I yeah. I don't know if you've ever used it, but I have actually just used coconut oil. I know it sounds you crazy. You can, but. Uh, yeah, yeah. You can use all kinds yeah. of oils. There's a lot of different yeah. things you can use. Linseed, like, linseed's kind of a traditional old school. That is the thing. traditional yeah. old school yeah. one, and I think it probably works better than um, coconut oil. But you know, if you're overly on, worried about. Yeah chemicals in your garden or right. anything like that in your garden and if you just want to use what you have on hand sure. i've actually heard of people using even like vegetable oil and stuff yeah. like that although yeah. vegetable oil as it ages gets kind of sticky yeah and then there's some there's just issues with uh when you kind of you're using a food grade oil like that that might um i guess it could go rancid yeah, it gets all yeah. sticky and nasty. So you, you could have those yeah. issues with with those kind of oils where you don't get that with linseed oil. It just doesn't seem exactly. to go yep. that way. But uh, yeah, so it's good. There's other um, there's other things you can use, natural products even that you can use. But I generally use the linseed oil. And actually, I generally use the raw. Actually, I have a heated room in my barn and okay. I generally just stick it in there. And it usually takes, it's usually dry within a week. And then it takes probably about another month to really cure in a heated room with good airflow. Um, so this is something I need to do with with mine. And I've actually bought, I think I bought boiled though. Yeah, boiled. I actually yeah. bought some boiled in hopes to actually get this done it, this year. Yeah, it cures within a couple of weeks, I think, on the yeah. boiled. Yeah, maybe a week or so. Yeah. I it, might have to bring them inside. Good. We have like a, a catch-all junk room that's smallish <laughs> and I might have to bring it inside and put it in there for a little yeah. bit. Because our garage is not heated at all. Yeah. It's, cold yeah but it works well and i like to do that with my axes and my hammers and my wheelbarrow handles i got wooden handles on my wood wheelbarrow and those okay. get really dry because you leave those things out in the sun i mean oh, i leave yeah. my i'll just yeah. flip my wheelbarrow over and leave it out weeks at a time you know outside and so it gets a lot of your know, weather you know hitting yeah. them handles so i do hit those more often i probably do hit those every year with something yeah. just to yeah they they tend to are- i've actually had to replace those because i didn't take care of them in the past and had to put new handles on my wheelbarrow yeah i think when we bought our two-wheeled wheelbarrow ours is not any of its none of its wood yeah and we bought the one with the plastic tub. I love traditional tools, but I, I hate to say it, but with like this, I just bought an axe, a new axe last week and or two weeks ago. And uh, it, uh, it doesn't have, I didn't buy a wooden handle. It's like one. a compass. It's, it's I the know. Com- yeah. It's the yeah. composite handle. And uh, because, yeah. you know, you just tend to with an axe, I mean, the wooden handles take a beating. I mean, they really can with an axe. They do. They do. So it's just something that, yeah, I and went with the composite. it's the last thing you want to break when you're swinging it. Right, right. <laughs> well, I, I'll tell you what I have less issue with it, with them breaking is um, it's hard to get, I find with, even when you're treating your handles on your wooden handles on axes, it's hard to, up where it goes up into the axe. Yes. Over years, that just shrinks. And it's hard to get any treatment up in there to keep that exactly. wood swollen. Yep. And and it'll get loose. The head just gets loose mm-hmm. on there. And and so I find that, that you know, that's kind of an issue. So the composite handles solve that problem. They use like a resin. It's fixed in there really good. Um, yep. Yeah, I've never had one of those uh, come apart. So I think that's why we ended up with the, well, the two-wheeled wheelbarrow was because then I could push it without flipping it over easier with heavy things. And it was the, comp- I don't know if it's plastic or composite, but the tub is... Because yeah. we do the same thing. We end up leaving it outside and we were yep. going through them pretty quickly. Yeah. And I think the handles are too. And we also ended up upgrading to the rubber wheels, the completely yeah. rubber wheels, because they were always going flat. It was driving us. Yeah. Crazy, so. uh, yeah. I don't have, yeah, that's a good idea because I do pump mine up constantly on my wheelbarrow. Yeah. Uh, and now I do have a metal uh, tub 
And you do have to, uh, yes, something we didn't even put in our list about painting things, you know, keeping things yes. painted that will rust. Yeah. I mean, that I do paint that wheelbarrow every couple of years because, again, I leave it out and it rusts, you know, and so I do throw yeah, some paint on it here too. and there. That's yeah. what we bought um, for a tractor because we beat the heck out of the bucket. <laughs> yeah, so you'll um, find putting paint on that so quite often. in the winter, my husband will heat yeah. the garage for long enough to do that. But we that's what we do. We, like, touch up little things that need paint. Because otherwise they're going to rust. So we have yeah. to treat that rust and then paint it. Or you treat the rust on like your hoe and stuff like that. And then you mm -hmm. oil it. And um, it just makes yeah. things last longer. And especially if, you know, we when we were young, we bought um, everything at yard sales or the cheapest we could find. Now that we're older, we're trying to spend a little bit more money on quality tools yeah. or ones that work better ergonomically for our hands and stuff like that. Yeah. And when you do that, you want to take care of them because you spent, you know, whatever, a hundred dollars on this such and such, or, you know, like with our tractor, um, replacing the bucket would be considerable amount of money. So you, oh, you yeah. do have to start taking care of them. Mm -hmm. yep. And it's, it's probably why I've gotten away from, uh, like I said, I was kind of a traditionalist too. If I went to buy a hammer or a shovel or, you know, an ax or whatever, I was always grabbing wooden handles. You know, I just always grabbed the wooden, anything with a wooden handle. Cause it just seemed more natural and right to me, you know? Yeah. But then as I've gotten older and I've realized how much maintenance they take and how long they last versus yeah. like the composite or the fiberglass, like a lot of my shovels yep. I'm buying now, they're fiberglass uh, handles, um, postal digger, you know, it's fiberglass handles. They just seem to hold up better. You know, they last longer and I don't have to maintenance them really. Yeah. I think my um, U-bar, which is a, you know, a U-bar is, what is the other word for them? Yeah. You're talking about the digging for or the, uh, yeah, for broad, broad fork, fork, broad, broad fork, fork yeah. or U-bar. Mine, I think is composite handles too. Yeah. 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 Uh, they put the fiberglass, a lot of them's fiberglass too. On yeah, some of it stuff. might be fiberglass. And, the yeah, only not, thing I and, don't like about fiberglass is where, as that ages, that really hurts when yeah, you get those. It in could start splintering. Yeah, yeah. yeah if it gets, and that it, yeah, hurts. <laughs> if you leave that stuff out in the outside, uh, yeah, right. it could definitely dry up and, and turn to that. Um, but that yeah, takes a long time. And I'm not so sure. And honestly, I'm not so sure about anything you can put on those to maintain those. I don't know if there's any kind of thing you put on those I don't to. Either. I think they're just kind of wear and tear and when replacing yeah, I mean, it does ever. take a while. We've had yeah, tent yeah. poles that have done that before, but I've never. Oh, had, yeah. Me too. So far, yeah. none of our uh, tools have, but man, those tent poles, you go to put yep. them up and the next thing you know, you got. I had them in a hunter's blind and, yes. uh, and I used for several years and they did that. And then I'd run my hand down them one day oh, and yeah. it left all these little fiberglass fibers in my hand. Oh, it was horrible. Yeah. I know what you're talking yeah, about. Those don't come out very No, good. no. That hurts for a while too. That's the uh, the handles. I mean, there's lots of things that have handles on them. And then, you know, you went on to talk about blade sharpening, which I'll be honest, that is something my husband usually does. I need to learn yeah. it better mm -hmm. because there's times when he's gone and I could, I need to do that. But for a long time, when it came to like for my pruners and loppers, all of them have the replaceable blades. They have like the three screws in them and they would come off and you can replace the blades. And I did that for several years using those. And then I bought one of the little carbide sharpeners. And now I routinely sharpen. I mean, even through the summer, but you could actually just get it ready even in the wintertime and have it ready for spring or whatever. But it's just a small little little file. I put a link in the show notes, oh, uh, Amazon. Okay. Yeah, I think it's only like eight or nine bucks, something like that. It's under 10 bucks. And it's just a little like five or six inch uh, with a carbide file on the end of it. And, and it works perfect on, on your loppers and your pruners and, and right. you put a nice little edge on them. Hit those a few times routinely. Cause man, when you get pruners that start getting dull, they start, they won't, you start tearing stuff instead of cutting it clean. It, I just hate that. It drives me nuts. Right. Well, and yeah. that's the first thing I use in the spring because mm -hmm. usually about mm, February, March, I'm pruning my fruit trees. Yeah. And taking yeah, when, cuttings off things. And the or, worst yeah. thing, the worst time, the worst thing to do to a tree when you cut it is use um unsharp pruners on them and then tear yep. that yep. bark and stuff so absolutely so yeah keep those sharp and like i said i mean the blades aren't super expensive to replace but you can make them last for years and years if you just sharpen them routinely and that, that little car that little carbide sharper a sharpener works really good because it's small enough and you just open them up and there's some good i think i even linked to a youtube video in the yes, uh, yeah did. i did i put a link in there to a youtube video guy showing you how to how to sharpen them with that little carbide uh, uh, um, uh, well, I think file. I'm 
Works I'm going to really buy well. some of those. Um, and you can do I'm, the same I'm thing like, with your loppers, uh, for your bigger tree loppers for doing your coppicing and your pollarding and things like that. <clears throat> I use them on yeah. those too. So um, I like to get my chainsaw chains all sharpened up. Yep. And I've got, you asked me about a like a file set. Like I, I found a link to, to a set that has yeah, like. Yeah, my husband has his like. Yeah. Each, I don't know where he got them. So Honestly, I don't recommend anything. Yeah, it ain't, I didn't even. I, I Found a set that looked decent. I, I bought mine over years and years at local hardware stores right, and yep. what hand me downs probably for my grandpa and dad and everything else. I have a bunch of different kinds of files that I've just pieced together over many, many years. But you can get nice sets that have the the, the like the triangle files, the round files, the flat files. Right. You know, and the thing is about it, I think if it's just a you probably don't want to get the cheapest sets. But I don't think it's something that you have to get the absolute highest end on either because files, I, I don't know. I've never had, granted, mine are all old files, but I've never really had an issue with those things getting unusable. You know what I mean? So I don't know yeah. how high quality you have to go with that. Um, yeah, but I've I used, have a whole chainsaw. Yeah. I need to learn how to sharp. My husband usually sharpens it for me. Yep. Get, to get those things sharpened up. Yeah. But it, yeah, I love that chainsaw. But um, yeah, he just, I don't know how he knows how to do it, but it's like, you sound like you do. You just kind of get those little tools. Out yeah. And it's it. not, it's not difficult. You can even buy um, the little guides that go on a file that will keep yeah. your angle right. Yeah. But if you I've know where, if you, you can do it, you can look at the angle on there. If you got a good eye for that and know the angle right. to put on those. And, and uh, there's a trick to it. I mean, there's, you can definitely doll it a chainsaw chain if you don't know how to do it right so you know you want to know how to do it but it don't take but just a few strokes on each tooth you know just three or four strokes on yep. each tooth just to knock a nice ledge on unless it's a really bad chain uh one that's really wore out but just to keep it sharpened and uh you know I so think it's, there's it's, a few places too that do it like uh, is it like yeah, ace hardware and stuff it's might. it's it's worth learning to do it's not hard it is. Um, yeah. Yeah. Wear, wear gloves when you do it because you can absolutely cut your hand pulling that pulling that chain around because you want to constantly be moving yeah. that chain. So wear, wear gloves when you do that. Cause I, I have actually done it in the woods out one time and just grabbed it bare hand and pull it back. And I can do it pretty good, but if you're careful, but if you go a little high on one of them teeth, you can <laughs> cut your fingers pretty good. And I've done that. So be careful with that. So it's just better to, to use some gloves, but not hard to do if once you learn how to do it, it's, right. it's especially if you get one of those little guides that set your angle for you. So where you can't, really go the wrong angle those make it real easy too they also have power ones um little electric ones that you yeah, can hit I it with it saw those. yeah those work yeah. nice too um, my grandpa always used those I mean, I, if you were doing it if you were using your chainsaw just a ton i can see where something like that would be really yeah they're nice they're quicker yeah. i mean you can do it a lot quicker with one of those for sure um axes Keep, you know, a nice flat file on an axe. There's a there's a skill to that, knowing the right angles, because if you go too, too uh, narrow on your angles, it'll actually the, the axe will actually dull faster. So there's there's a nice there's a nice medium there where you get a nice sharp axe, but you don't make it too pointy to where it dulls too fast. So there's just a happy medium there to learn how to do that. Um, it's kind of like the old story, you know, about the guy who. The old man who's uh, chopping wood next to a young guy who's way more fit and better shape and out there and they're chopping wood. And he, the old man takes a break, you know, every couple hours and just disappears for a few minutes, you know, and then comes back. And at the end of the oh, day, yeah. he's got a way bigger pile of a split wood right, than the young yeah. guy. And he's like, how is that possible? He says, because when I take a break, I'm sharpening my axe, you know, keeping it sharp. And I'm going to tell you, a sharp axe will definitely split wood a whole lot better than a dull one. I, I, I know that. And it's safer. too. Yes, it's much safer. All all tools are really a lot safer uh, when they're, they're sharp. sharp. So, yep. yeah, absolutely. Yep. Knives included. Um, saw blades. Now, if you're using like hand saws, uh, crosscut saws, all kinds of saws, all your different hand saws. I have a bunch of saws. There's a real skill to sharpening those because they're the depending on how small the teeth are, especially and how many teeth you have, it can be a pretty tedious process, but it's a nice skill to have. Um, what I like to do is take a couple two by fours and clamp uh, oh. the 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 saw blade in that, and it gives you a little more stability when you're when you're filing. It doesn't sense. get that rock, and, and and I just put a couple clamps on and I pinch it. And I just leave the teeth sticking up above those, just right above those two by fours. So I can get in there and I can just kind of lay on them on them two by fours and kind of run the file back and forth across there. And it just gives me a kind of a guide that way. And it, it keeps that blade from flexing while I'm doing it. 
but there's a real trick to that and being able to identify which way to go on the different teeth because you want to alternate back and forth uh right. one side go down one side then flip the saw around then do the other side every other tooth generally how they are how they're set up but you watch some videos on that before you try that there's probably some but there are there's like some find somebody that knows what they're doing yeah which will but, be pretty obvious in the youtube video or whatever. but if you've ever yeah. used a dull hand saw versus a, a sharpened hand saw it is night and day difference i mean you will whip through a piece of wood so fast with a hand saw even if it's good and sharp so huh. okay. it, it, but it's a little bit of a tedious process especially if you got a, a one of them saw blades with a lot of teeth you know and they're different right. saws for different projects, depending on what you're cutting, how you're cutting it. But yeah, some of them are really hard to cut. Some of them are are, are hard to file. Some of them aren't. Now, those are your, um, generally, those are your little angle or little triangle looking files or your square files, the real small okay. ones, where okay. the round ones are more your chainsaw files. Right. I don't yes. know if you've seen, seen those or not. I, yeah. have, I don't know if we've ever sharpened manual saw blades because we really... Yeah. Don't use them that often. I find I use them quite a bit if I just yeah. need to cut something like, really fast or whatever. I would like whatever. the idea yeah. of using them, but I haven't. So yeah. that's good to I, know. When I'm doing little word working projects with my grandson, especially, we break out the hand tools. I mean, when I say the hand tools, I mean like the hand saws and even like the hand crank that's drills. Fun. We'll get the hand crank oh, yeah. drill out and use that. And that's fun because he just thinks that's neat to use the actual course, tools. like yeah. it. And it's safer for a oh, kid yeah, than definitely. breaking out the, the the power tools. He's five years old, so I don't really like, but he loves exactly. to grab the saw and just cut it a piece of wood. He thinks that's fun. So, well, I mean, people in the past built entire homesteads with Yes, this, so. yes, exactly. So, yeah, it's nice to have them on hand and keeping them sharp. So um, yeah. that's something I like to do. Uh, get your lawnmower blades sharpened. Um, yeah. Now, those you can, I usually do with a bench grinder. Um, I just run down my bench grinder. Yeah, but I think my husband does too. Now, here's the thing, though. Get you one of them little balancers. I don't know if your husband's probably got one if he's balancing the uh, – because if you get – if you grind one side off more than the other, your lawnmower will actually get a, a vibration, a really heavy vibration. If you – that that right. that, that uh, saw blade uh, – that uh, I'm sorry, that lawnmower blade is actually balanced to, to keep vibration right. out of that motor. So you want to keep the balance. You want to take the exact same amount off of each side when you're sharpening them. So, yeah, there's a little just – I mean, it's like a couple bucks for these little – it's just a little angled yeah, I'm pretty with a sure hole does. in the center and yeah. you set it on it and it kind of balances it out. You can see it's balanced, but yeah, have one of those on hand because those are nice to keep it balanced when you're sharpening it, sharpening it. Right. So I like to do that. So, you know, there's probably other things that ha that need sharpen. Of course, your knives and things that you're going to use right. for processing and things like that. Well, but, and you're like your hoe and your horseshoe hoe, even yep. shovels. I mean, you're mm -hmm. sticking them in the dirt constantly. Which yeah, hitting, ro hitting, hitting rocks and everything else, taking yeah. chunks out of which Absolutely. is why, as much as I like to be barefoot, when I'm in my garden using shovels and stuff like that, and I have my sharp tools, I do wear my boots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But it's worth taking a little time. It's worth taking a little time to to keep right. an edge on these things, keeping keep things sharpened up, and it will make your job a lot easier come spring when you start using these tools again, for sure. And you won't have to take the time to, to do that. Now, yeah. something that I like to inspect, and whether you're comfortable fixing them or repairing them or not, is up to you and where you're at in right. your comfort level but that's right. electrical cords uh safety be safe you know look yeah. at your power cords if you don't feel comfortable changing one repairing one take it to somebody and get it done it's a whole lot cheaper than buying a whole nother piece of electric equipment right. you know a skill saw or a jigsaw or whatever right. you're using um your drills your power drills that have actual plug-in cords um you know check all your cords make sure they're not split and cracked and be safe and 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 you're not going to get electrocuted <laughs> or anything. Yeah, so that wouldn't be good. Or create fires or whatever. Absolutely. And, and not everybody's safe or feels safe messing with those to fix them and repair them. And that's fine. Um, but get somebody to do that. It'll still be cheaper than buying a whole new one more than likely. Yeah. So, but it's a good time to, to get your list and get those repaired, especially if you have to send them off to get them fixed. Um, it's, it's, right. a, this is a good time to do it uh, for something like that. Um I tires you tires. added tires on there uh, yeah we um we don't use a lot i've never used a lot of equipment on our small homestead but now that we're on our bigger <laughs> homestead um mm -hmm. we actually have a tra tractor tire that we babied all summer because it you know somehow it has a bulge in it who knows running over yeah. stumps all sorts oh, yeah. of stuff. so we'll be getting that we'll be either ordering a new one or getting it fixed mm-hmm this winter just because it's the best time to do it but 
inspect them. I mean, we were surprised. Um, we didn't even notice it until yeah. we were just inspecting the tractor after bringing it home and looking at it. So, you know, sometimes you don't notice it. You don't actually put a hole in it, right? Or it's got a really tiny leak. So it's just a good time to check tractor yeah. tires or your maybe replace your wheelbarrow tires with the completely rubber ones or, um, yeah. you know, there's a lot of different tools that possibly would have tires you know yeah and actually when you're dealing with bigger equipment like that it's a good time to check everything i mean if there's any kind of yep. front end components that are getting loose or you know bearings that need replaced or just anything like that it's a great time to really go all the way through it and just if you know that something fell a little off yeah you know, check it out and get that stuff replaced in the winter time it's the time to do it for sure right yeah yep and then um we talked about this already but treating rust yeah. And, you know, you can, yeah. there's different ways to treat rust. You can sand it off. You can, there's actually some yeah. mild acids that will eat it off without doing any damage to the tool. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that might even be better because when you're sanding stuff, you're actually taking some of the metal with you, right. exactly. obviously, yeah. um, where a lot of times those mild acids will clean it off without doing that. So uh, yeah. sometimes there's, yeah. there's ways to do that too. Uh, I can't even think of what they are, but I've used I know them in my the past. husband uses there's it depends on obviously it depends on what you're using it on. I mean, my husband uses some kind of product, but that's the tractor. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if I was in my garden, I wouldn't I want anything I would want it to be more organic and paint or anything in the garden. But um yep. with the tractor, we want to keep the rust off of it. I mean, that was a big mm -hmm. investment. So absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. There's a lot you can do with um Again, cleaning, repair, and main, maintaining, doing services on them, whatnot. But sometimes you just have to repair something. You just flat out have to replace it or repair it. And I'm I'm in this mentality. You know, there's so many people, and we talked about this on the last episode about how I went out to find an axe handle and couldn't find right. one. All you could find was the axes, and it just drove me crazy that we're in this mentality now that where we don't replace broken equip or, or repair broken equipment we just replace it you know you break an axe handle you go buy a whole new axe you know um, a shovel handle you go buy a whole new shovel you don't replace the handle and i i just i hate that mentality it just i mean there's a time for that maybe when yeah. it's something's you know really seriously bad or you just feel like there's enough wear and tear on the other part to where hey i might as well get a new one there's a time for that but a lot of times especially when an axe or a shovel there's absolutely nothing wrong with the right. main component, you just need to replace the handle. So it's a great time to replace a broken handle or a cracked handle on something. Um, I've had a lot of those, you know, over the years, just get a crack or whatever. And it's just a good time to, to get on that um, and just replace it. You know, if you can find one <laughs> locally, I had trouble finding one locally, uh, but you can find things like that online with, with very little trouble. I mean, you know, but I will tell you, there is a, there is a skill to putting in axe handles and shovel handles and things like that and getting them good and tight to where they're going to hold up and last. Um, and you can find some good YouTube videos on that, right. but knowing how to space those out and get the wood to swell and certain things. I mean, you can, you know, there it's a forgotten skill for a lot of people. It really is. Um, it's not even something. It's something I had to learn as an adult later in life. Cause I remember my dad doing it, but I don't remember him ever showing me how to do right. it. And, and, and I remember the first time I put an axe handle in, well, first of all, it's so super tight when you first get them. It's like, how do you get that in there? And then how do you get it to where it stays tight? And there's a skill to it. There's, there's a, you know, knowing how to do it right. So yeah, I'll just turn you to YouTube for that because <laughs> you will find, uh, you know, it's the kind of information you really need to see some videos on and, and understand better. It's kind of like, that's how I feel about the, the sharpening, um, actual, uh, 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 saw blades, hand saw blades. Yeah, you just uh, kind of have to see. Go watch a video or something on that and really see how people do that. It's hard to put that into words to help you understand it. But right. yeah, there's, there's a trick <clears throat> to that. It's a good time to go through all of your stuff and make sure all the screws and bolts are tight. Yeah. Um, Things get loose, like hand, like the handles on your saw blades or on your saws. Uh, I'm using my hand saws. They, those hand, the, the handles will get all wobbly and loose because the screws and bolts and nuts came loose or you know, stuff's loose on your lawnmower or whatever. I mean, just go through things, make things, make sure things are tight, uh, are holding together good, tighten them up, you know, uh, nuts will loosen up over time. You know, sometimes they just need to tighten them up or you might even have to replace a, a bolt or a nut or a screw in this or that and get right. things tightened up. So it's a good time to go through and, and look at those things. Hoses and belts on your yeah. equipment. Look Hoses at that stuff. And belts. Yeah. yeah. Well, and even to, your lawn hoses. 
Yes, that too. I'm even thinking about just the equipment. Yeah. Uh, you're you're dealing with hydraulic hoses now on on equipment. Yeah. So you got hydraulic hoses. You got um your your water your uh, uh like coolant hoses and things on equipment. And then we get into our garden hoses and things. And absolutely, it's a time to repair those things. Look and see for cracks and splits and yeah. you know wear and tear and just fix and or even replace in some of those. Talking about um you know, fix it up, wear it out type of thing. Even mm-hmm. hoses have repair kits. You can yeah, cut yeah. them off and make them shorter. Absolutely. Or, I, I put a know. link in the show notes uh, for some repair, uh, hose repair attachments. Now, here's the thing, though. I have used several different kinds. Stay away from the plastic ones. They're garbage. I'm oh, telling you, they're gar- you get the ones that are either zinc or copper or brass or whatever, and and put those together. They they hold up so much better. They seal so much better. Yeah. Um. I've bought those plastic ones, and man, they crack and split and bust. And I mean, they're just junk. I haven't found one plastic one yet of the yeah. ones you repair hoses with or put an end on a hose with that that hold up good. They they're just horrible. Um. But get the good metal ones, and they hold up really really good. Yeah. And there's these little things. I don't know if you've used those where you where our spigot comes out is usually where there's a lot of wear and tear from yanking on it. Mm-hmm. We've found those little they look it's like a springy thing that you can put over the oh, hose like the or quick it's releases. like an extension yeah, yeah and that like actually chuck. has helped <laughs> us not tear that end of the hose apart oh you're talking about just just a it's just a spring that basically keeps it from flexing yeah oh okay yeah, yeah and yeah, that's yeah. helped extend our hoses because that's where we yeah. get a lot of wear and tear on they, us there. They do actually make the, uh, I was thinking maybe you were talking about the, uh, like, it's almost like an air chuck for like air hoses, but it's for water and it's like a quick release oh, yes. and they just pop together. That way you ain't constantly doing the turning, which we will actually break those sometimes when you're yes. turning them. You just do the quick pop on, pop off kind of things. Those yeah. are nice. I actually don't have any of those on my hoses, but I really? have seen those and they're okay. really sweet. Now I'll have... probably have those. Yeah. Yeah, we have the spring thing, and then we have the quick release. Yeah, those are nice. It. I've, I've it been is, to people's houses that use those. Those are nice. That, the twisting motion, which yep. eventually will ruin yep. your hoses. And it we've sure started, will. as well as everything else, like I was saying earlier, we've started not buying the cheap hoses and started investing a little more money in mm-hmm. good hoses because we just were buying new ones all the time. Right. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's good advice. But there, there's... So many things around your property that yep. you're you're using, of course. That it's just the time to look at what you have. I mean, we all have different things. Now, I think about you know just even all the hand tools and stuff I have. I mean, it's a yeah. good time to make sure those things are good and cleaned up. And <clears throat> which I feel like brings us to the next topic, which is and organized, yeah. organizing and storing your homestead tools. Um, with my actual like, I've got you know I've I've done a lot of mechanic work in my life, so I've got a pretty big mechanic toolbox. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to tell you, like through the summer when I'm doing a lot of projects and working on stuff, it seems like most of them tools end up out of my toolbox and piled up on my bench somewhere. (laughs) And then so this is a really good time to say, okay, let's get these back in the toolbox where they belong in the right places, organized. Let's get them hung up where they belong. Let's put them in the right places. And with my mechanic toolbox, that's a, that's a big deal. I'm all the time pulling out screwdrivers and pliers and I'll open a drawer up one day to get screwdrivers. I have like zero Phillips screwdrivers in there, but they're scattered everywhere. I mean, I probably have 30 of them. Exactly. Where are they? You know, they're everywhere. So uh, it's like, so it's like, I got to go on the hunt then. And then I spend more time looking for the tools to do a job than it takes me to do the job. And it happens time and time and time again. And I'll say when I was younger, it wasn't that big of a deal. I seemed like I was way more organized, but I was like, why is that? Is it because I'm that less organized as an older person? And I don't think that's the case. I think it's just that I have so much more stuff now. Yeah. When I was kind of, I was kind of like a force to minimalist back then, you know, I didn't have the money to buy a lot of stuff. So I had what I had and I, it was just easier to keep organized, you know, and now I have, you know, I'm 50 years old. So it's like, I have a lot of stuff, you know, I'm just, I'm, I've, I've accumulated a lot of things over the years and those yeah. things take up a lot of space and they're everywhere. That's exactly the same yeah. thing that happens at our house. I mean, I wish I could say that I'm super organized, but um, as we've gotten older, we've got more going on. We have more stuff, which is good and bad, but mm-hmm. my husband's also pretty handy like you. And so he fixes everything. It's rare that we have anybody fix anything. So <laughs> there's a tool for everything. Yeah. You know? yeah. And, and then on top of like, he will plumb or do small plumbing. And so he's got mm-hmm. tools for that. And yeah, um, it's part of being self-sufficient. I mean, knowing how to yeah. having the tools to do those things. Yeah. 
Yeah. So keeping those organized is definitely, and then sometimes organizing things costs money. So when you don't have money to buy shelving or proper toolboxes, that kind of right. is harder. So, um, but yeah. Yeah. But you could even build a lot of stuff. I mean, there was a time yeah. when metal toolboxes, big mechanic set toolboxes didn't exist. People right. built cabinets to keep the stuff in and they had boards they hung stuff up on and, you know, they just did certain things. But like now we have our tools are a little more sophisticated maybe and we might right. have to have a certain kind of a setup for things. And I think about like I have a ton of stuff that takes rechargeable batteries. You know, yeah. I have my drills and I have some different kinds of saws and little grinders sure. and I have a lot of stuff that takes that needs these rechargeable tools. And so I built a battery charging station, you know, and I actually built it out of wood. You can buy them too, like the I'm wet really metal rack ones. This, There's a lot of different lot plans of on, on YouTube. Uh, I link to one. It's actually the one that's pretty similar to the one I built and you can hang your drills, your drills and, and tools actually hang on the bottom of it. And then I have like the complete, all of them, all, I, I wired it, you know, put on my, uh, the outlets and things are up there. Oh, uh, a strip. A power strip. The power I strip, have the power strip yeah. across there where everything's plugged in. And I have all my, you know, I have it all organized and where I can plug all the batteries in right above the tool. And then some That's tools I have idea. two or three batteries for. So I might have a couple chargers and I just keep everything kind of like that, you know, because, you know, for one thing, it, I just, as soon as one starts wearing down, I'm popping it back in the charger, grabbing the next one, putting it in. And I just try to keep it super organized. And I hang that back up underneath those batteries. And then if it's like a drill, for example, I have like three, three levels. I have like the, where the, the drill actually hangs at the bottom. I have the, the batteries right above it. And then I have a bigger cabinet area above it or just a hole basically, but it's, you know, it's a slot, but it's a bigger area. And that's where I keep all the screws and things like that, that I would need for the drill, you know, just any kind of different drywall screws or wood screws or whatever nice. for my drill in the boxes above that so i kind of have everything there when i need it instead of hunting all over my garage for that so because i the power drill is probably or my my hand uh my cordless drill is probably the most used honestly yeah. probably the most used tool on my homestead i mean period uh, believe it or not anything. i actually use one a lot cleaning yeah i mean just <laughs> they have <laughs> do like you? little ends you can get yeah yeah pads and stuff yeah, well, yeah they're amazing and then my pole saw my chainsaw my pole mm -hmm. chainsaw has a battery yeah and yeah. um and speaking of missing objects when we brought everything home from the camper somehow i cannot find the charger for that and exactly. i know it's here if you had the charging like, station I haven't had time right that, there yeah yeah now that things have slowed <laughs> down but i'm thinking man a charging station would be really yeah there's really some really neat designs i've seen them made, made out of pvc where they like take right. a bigger piece of pvc and it slides into that i've seen oh. mine's out of wood right. or skip but the pvc would be really easy too but everything is so expensive like honestly you could build this out of pallet wood you can well, that's what I was just thinking. I'm like, man, yeah. we got uh, we got lots of. My husband has access to really nice pallets at work yeah. because they get heavy metal. And Show him some of these designs. Like, He'd probably oak. love to get in the garage this winter and make a nice little charging station like that. I bet he'd love. That'd probably be right up yeah. his alley for yeah. making. And they're not hard. It's it's not like a high skill thing to make. I mean, it's right. just a, some shelving and I mean, just the way you design it. It's it real has to easy. Be functional, not beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice to have something that looks nice. You know, right, something that's but... Instagram worthy, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, right. But if you don't have great skills and you're hard, working on your skills. Hard to you keep know. up with Instagram worthiness. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't even try anymore. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, that's one thing you can make. Uh, there's also garden tool hangers. Now you can buy those. They make some really yep. nice ones for hanging your shovels and your rakes and your yep. hoe and all the things up, keeping everything nice and organized, your axes, whatever. But you can make them pretty easy too. Uh, again, yeah. you can use pallet wood. You can use some scrap two by fours, uh, whatever. It, it, they're not hard to make. And you can keep all them things up off the floor, hanging on a wall out of your way. Yeah. Right there where you know where they're at when you need one. And again, lots of you search garden tool hanger or tool You'll hanger yep. on YouTube or Pinterest. You're going to see all the pictures or yep. videos you want to see of them. There's tons of them out there. Exactly. You're not a builder. You can buy them. Amazon sells them. Nice little yep. wire ones or metal ones or even wooden ones. You can buy all kinds of different ones. They're they're You can buy them. But they're really, really uh, worth having just to keep things out of your way and keep them where you can find them. You know, that's, that's the big thing when you need it, you know, right where it's at, you go get it. And there you have it. So <laughs> you save your time. I hate wasting time looking for stuff, even though I do a yeah. lot of it. I need um, to focus a lot on this, this winter, the yeah. organizing, it would be very helpful. 
Now, this came to my mind, and I was thinking about, like, in my greenhouse or even just seed starting in a, in a spring, and that's cleaning and organize all my seed starting tools. I consider my trays and all those things my tools. They're tools. Right. And and here's the thing. I tried to buy – I have a bunch of the cheap ones, too. But lately, the last couple of years, I've been spending the money to buy the heavier-duty ones. I don't know if you've yes. ever seen the ones that are sold by Bootstrap Farmer. Um, I you, I started they have on, a they have their own website or you can go on Amazon. He has a page on I, I link to the one on Amazon, the his page on Amazon. And okay. he's got the trays are really thick, like the 10, 20 trays you would buy. Right. The cell, uh the cell uh for the like the 72 cells and the whatever, all the different cells. Okay. They're really thick and they last a long time. And because then once you get those cheap ones, you get at Walmart or whatever, oh, they're so last, like, brittle. Oh my gosh. They horrible. won't last. I mean, one time one use season, almost. Yep. Yeah. They're just and it's they're, such a waste, not just financially, but yeah. just, you know, you'll spend just a little first. bit more money by that thicker, heavier, especially if you're going to use something like plastics. We don't like plastics are are bad. Right. I mean, let's just admit it. They're just bad for the environment. Yeah. But if you get something that's multiple use they can use for years, it's actually not that bad. Yeah. It's actually not not really that harmful. I might uh, order uh, some of those. I've been getting mine at the gross store, and the gross store yeah. has the same thing where they have the really cheap ones, and then you can get the nicer ten twenty yeah. trays. Yeah. These, the ones that I've been using, have been lasting me two to three years. But I'm gonna order one of his and see if it's even thicker. I feel like if you're fairly not too radical with the ones from Bootstrap Farmer, they can last you for several years. I okay. mean, they're they're pretty good. Like I said, he sells lots of different stuff uh, there, but you can take a look at his uh, Amazon page, all the listings, or even just go to their website. I think it's just bootstrapfarmer.com, I think. Yeah. And he's got some good stuff. And like I said, I'm not tied in with them. I'm not an affiliate for him right. or anything yeah. like that. Just some good stuff there. I mean, I've, I've bought a few of their things in the last couple of years and Okay. It feels like some really high quality stuff. Well, there's like, a lot of um, like Justin, Justin Rhodes, I noticed does this, but also the John Jeevens, which I've posted the book a few times um, with the how to grow more vegetables. They actually show you how to build wood ones. Yep. Make them out of wood. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Not, not a bad deal. You know, um, I feel like when a little I'm bit dealing more work intensive, though, the way you have to grow in them but yeah. and cleaning them yeah. because they will the moisture absorbs Harvard. into them and, and you could get fungus in them. And so I think there's a little bit more risk there when it comes to Probably. maybe keeping things clean, which is what I was talking about with cleaning and organizing your seed starting yeah. tool. It's a really good time to get them organized, get them stacked, see what you have, what you don't have, what you need to be thinking about getting if you don't have it. So get them organized. That way you know what you got. When the time comes, you got it. You don't have to put it in an order. Exactly. Also, you can go ahead and get them cleaned. What clean them up. Clean yours with? I I generally first I just scrub them with some I'll just get some Dawn dish right. soap and I'll get soap and water on them and clean them, wash them really good, and then I generally just spritz them with peroxide. That's what I do. Exactly. Is that what you do? Yeah, some people use I vinegar. I wash mine in water. Well, I try to wash them like when it's still warm outside. I try to at least rinse them because mm -hmm. I don't want all of that in my plumbing. But then I um I do the same thing. I wash them with soap and then I use vinegar. Okay, vinegar or not yeah. vinegar. I oh. use um. I peroxide, use the peroxide, the hydrogen peroxide. Yeah, yep. uh, yeah. Some people do use vinegar though. Some people spritz vinegar yeah, you can on use them. Vinegar I, too. But I just use peroxide. I just get a little spray bottle of that and just spray them down, stack them, let it dry, air dry, and then yeah. it's fine. It's ready to go. And I go ahead and get all that done. So that way, spring gets here. I can just grab them and start getting my seeds in them. You know, throw some soil yeah. in them and start going. And I don't have to think about it. It's not. It's one less thing you got to do in that busy springtime. You know, exactly. it's ready to go. And I got them all stacked in the greenhouse, ready to rock and roll. You can do that with all your pots. Um, you know, just yeah. get everything just ready. You know, there's just even your tools. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can clean up your your little uh hand yeah, your little hand spades well. and things like that. Yeah, and just get them ready to go. Yeah, absolutely. I um I organize, I don't know how you organize your stuff, but I actually have a four cabinet metal. What do you call those? Why am I not thinking of this? <laughs> Words are escaping us. <laughs> I know. it's. We do this in the morning, folks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I noticed we've been struggling with words a little bit more Fairly since we started doing it in the morning. <laughs> uh, um, you know, like a file cabinet. Yeah. We got okay. it for really cheap at like a garage sale or something, a metal filing cabinet. Mm -hmm. And I actually put a lot of my tools and seeds in folders in, in that. That's what I do with my seeds also. Yeah. I have yeah. a, well, I use the, uh, I don't have a big filing cabinet. I use those file 
I, this is a whole different, this isn't about tools or anything. This is probably on our next right. week's topic, actually. Well, but it's organizing. Yeah. But I actually use the file boxes. Have you ever seen those? They're just like carry boxes, but they're yeah. for file folders. Yeah. I have a couple of those, two or three, three, three of those, actually. But what I like about those, I grab the whole box. I can take it out to the garden. Yes. And I can just have it with me. I pop the lid on it and I start going through those yeah. files and I just have them labeled, you know, whatever different mm-hmm. seeds I have. And that's how I use those. That's kind of neat. So right. yeah, we'll but probably talk about that. I have like on... my little, I have some of my hand tools because I use some of my hand tools inside when I start my gardens in the spring, you know, my seeds and mm-hmm. my little seed or my little, you know, my markers, all that kind of little stuff I have mm-hmm. in those drawers. Nice. It's kind of handy to have it right there, right next to my, um, table that i plant my seedlings on yeah and it's a good and you time can get like those said, like so cheap on like marketplace yeah. or people just want to get rid of them yeah so. absolutely i agree they're they're out there yeah people don't want the big old things in their house anymore they get rid of them now don't they yeah yeah so it's a good time just to figure out what you have what you don't have have it ready yep get it clean yep. so it's, I, I think it's a it's a biggie now i i guess this is a little bit out of order but i also have on this list organizing your tool manuals. I don't know if you guys keep any kind of tool manuals around. Like, you know, everything you buy comes with a two or three or four page little pamphlet on how to maintain it or how to get extra parts for it or a website you can go to to get information about it. Yes, you're holding up your binder right now. I'm with, holding with up a binder. My a husband, binder. Like I said, my husband has tons yes. and tons of equipment because he's yes. in the, he's kind of a jack of all trades. So this Me is too. just one of them for his wire feed welder. Okay, I do the same okay. thing. I have binders. I have a three hole punch, and every yep. time I get anything with a little pamphlet or a little manual of any kind that's not more than just a few pages thick. I smack it with that three ring punch and I stick it in a binder. And then on the front of that binder, I will write however, whatever different things are in that. Like there may be 50 different manuals in one binder, you know, and I'll just, I'll just write, take a Sharpie and write on the manual. What tool is, has the manual in that binder and, and just a good way to keep track of those things. Now I will say these days, that's less important than it was 20 years ago when I started doing that because the internet, Anything you really need to look up, you can actually search it and usually find the manual right. or some yeah. information about it. But I like having that stuff. It just makes me feel better to have those manuals in a place where I know where they're at. Because if you just throw those things on a bench or over in a corner or in a box, you're never going to find them when you need well, them. Well, and sometimes you don't have, like, I don't know, when we're a lot of these manuals, or they used to, I don't know if they do as much now, but they would give you pretty extensive part complete and schematic expensive like extensive yep. schematics of yep. like absolutely your tractor taken apart and yep. like what that exact screw part number I, is and my husband actually uses these yeah a lot. i have a lot of power tools that have the same thing i mean like i got table saw that have a breakdown of the schematic completely on yeah. everything in it yeah. to where if you need one little certain part you can find that part number in the in order that part number so it's, yeah, I love and having those things on hand. We're kind of old school. I mean, he uses his phone, but he actually prefers to see it physically in a, yeah. well, it's just easier <laughs> sometimes. It's yeah. just easier sometimes to have that book laid out in front of you in a big piece of paper instead of this little tiny screen. <laughs> yeah. Just last week or two, a couple of weeks ago, when I was putting together the, uh, the greenhouse, the aquaponics system, I, re- I had my timers, you know, that were in a box. I hadn't used them for a year. I dug them out. I'm like, I don't even remember how to set the timers on these because there's nothing really on the timer that says how to do this. And sometimes you have to hold a button for five seconds or whatever, do this, do that. I'm like, okay, go find the manual. So I'll go to the binder, turn it to the man. There it is. There's the instructions. Yeah. I did actually see it, but what's funny is before I did that, I actually went and I thought, okay, I just, I just, uh, Google searched that timer. I found it, but the print was so stinking small on my phone. I was like, I can't even see that. So I went and found the, I went and found the actual manual for it. And yeah, I programmed them because I couldn't remember how to do it. Everything just about comes with something like that. And it's just great to have those things organized. And well, and if you have it organized and in the binder system, sometimes it is quicker to just reach up there and go, oh, there's the binder on that than it is to actually Google. Yeah, absolutely. If you know where they're at and you keep them, I mean, I keep them on my bookshelf right next to all my books and stuff. And uh, yeah, I know exactly where they're at and I can just grab them and and do it really fast. So yeah, um, that's what I use it for. Because what do you have here? It has so many things in it now. It's sometimes hard. Like there's 45 models of whatever. So yeah. 
Okay, I'll let you share on this next step. You're talking about numbering and, and organizing like well, drawers and totes yeah, and things. Yeah, and it might be, you know, like going into another podcast, but just speaking quickly on the organizing um, shadow boards. Um, oh, yeah, super this important. Is, this yeah. is going to sound crazy, but if people don't know what they are, the first time I ever saw one was actually when I was a teenager and we toured a prison. <laughs> <laughs> and they're kitchen utensils. So you know something's missing. Whole, yeah, it was a whole <laughs> yeah. wall full of like, Pots and knives <laughs> and it was like the shape of the knife for example this would probably be really important in prison yeah was on that wall so exactly. if that knife was missing well it sounds see- dumb but i do the exact same thing here in my yeah. own shop so you can do this with like your <laughs> screwdrivers your i don't know your wrenches anything like that and um and you can see if it's missing or not, if yep. that part's missing. And and then it gives it always a place to return it. So even I, if that's I was, I was out in the shop helping yep. clean up, I wouldn't have to say, where do you want this put? I did this years ago for my yeah. wife and kids because when they would go out to get a tool or had to took a tool back out to put it up, I just where I'd hang the tool up and then I just took a Sharpie or magic marker and I just went around it on the pegboard. Yep. To show the outline of what it was. So when they took it to put it back up, they knew exactly how exactly. it went back up there. And, and when my kids were little, I mean, they were bad about just uh, t- take us back out to the garage and they just throw it on a bench or whatever, on a cart right. or whatever. And it never gets put up. And like I said, I was a lot more organized when I was younger. So everything had a specific place. And um, yeah, then they knew where to put it. And I think it's a great idea. I still have the pegboards out here with the outlines on them. Right. Not everything's yeah, there, but they're still there. Do. <laughs> and and then the winter is a perfect time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's a good and idea. And then pegboards. My husband has now, I think the pegboard material has gotten pretty expensive. But mm-hmm. um, you know, as always, we found something at a garage sale. My husband bought a whole bunch of pegboard material with peg thingies and you know, above his workbench in the garage, he's got <clears> tons of pegboards. And um if I ever have a dream homestead, I don't know if any of you homestead people have ever seen Julia Child's kitchen, but it was just basically tons of pegboards and everything <laughs> in the kitchen. Hanging- yeah, that's oh neat. yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I don't, I love the idea of a Pinterest kitchen, but I also love the idea of that just total functionality of it. Yeah, right practical there. and functional. Yeah. Yep. That's yeah. yeah sometimes so pegboards are fantastic for things. Um, and then QR codes. Oh, yeah. Tell me all about this. This sounds interesting. Okay. So this is definitely major modern homesteading with, you know, using your <laughs> cell phone. But there are these stickers that you can buy, and it comes with a free app. And um, the stickers are, is a QR code. And what it is, is you take this, you have like a tote. For, so this would be like for your smaller, say you have, I don't know, 15 different kinds of screws. And you have them in a tote because it just works better. Mm-hmm. You would take this QR code, you would scan it, and then in, under that file, it creates a file just for that QR code. You can put a picture. You can take a picture with your phone and put the picture in that. And then you can list everything that's in that box. And the nice part is, is you can be in your garage and say, I wonder where that box of screws are. And if my wood screws that are four inches long are in that box, so you can actually go into your phone, into the app and put um, wood screws and it'll tell you the exact location of the tote and which tote it's in. And then you say you come downstairs to your basement, you scan it and it'll say, yep, this is the tote that it's in. So you can be like at the grocery store, you can be at the parts store and say, do I have this at home? Yeah, total technology, it. but fantastic. And we you can do use, this with so many things. Oh, yeah. We use so many totes here. Like half of my barn is filled with just totes. Because yeah. like when I took down the, say, the Agrabah on my row cover this year, it went in a tote. You know, I, yep. I rolled it up. I put it in totes. I've got all the different, you know, the things that hold the clamps, all that stuff in a tote. And then I might, you know, we might take whatever. I mean, the, the garden supply stuff, if you put that in a tote right. or whatever, and you could actually put what different ones are in that tote and stacked up and QR code on it. I love the idea of that. That yeah, is. Yeah. And, and, and it's not expensive. I think, I think I'm, I'm looking right now. So it's $12 and you get 45 labels. Yeah. That's, that's so not 45 bad. totes. And then and but it comes with play, basically this. like an app too or whatever that yeah, comes the with app that. Is okay. Free. Free. And, okay. Um, that's I'm sure great. that there's more than just this brand out there. This is just the brand that I've yeah. used. I actually have used this to organize people's houses when I 
clean that their house. That is nice. I um, love that. You can do it. They can use Christmas that in closets, stuff. under the bed stuff, whatever. Wherever, you, wherever you you're stacking of. anything. The sky yeah. is the limit. You can Absolutely. do it with work stuff. You can do it with stuff you have stored in a storage unit, whatever. Um, That's it's brilliant. just amazing. But you can also do this really cheap if you're like, if money is really tight or you don't want to do, because the one thing you do have to have with this tote skin, I did play around with it. You do have to have... Um, Somehow it's stored in a cloud somewhere because if you don't have internet, you can't access it. Right. So you could do this easily with, this is how I started this system was, I don't remember where I saw it, but we used three by five cards mm -hmm. and you put everything that's in that tote on a three by five card. You number the tote, you put the three by five card in like a three by five card holder, and then you can search through that index and go, oh, um, my screws are in box 45 and you have you have where your box 45 is on that card and where yeah where it's at and you have your your box labeled and then you can also put it on the outside of the box that's like the low tech way and obviously it would take longer and you wouldn't be able to tell what's there from somewhere else but you don't need the internet for that either so it's, yeah. it's very similar to the QR code but a little Motel. more old school and yeah. yeah my my current school. system is stick it in a tote and then try to remember which tote I stuck it in last year when all the right. totes look the same. So I right. end up opening up like 30 totes trying to figure out which one has that stuff in it. That's what <laughs> happened to us too. And then when I was, you know, at a few homes that I clean, I do other things for them. And every year I would waste time trying to find <laughs> the specific santa claus that they wanted displayed for christmas and i was like which of the 40 boxes of christmas stuff is this in <laughs> yeah so it does help yeah. not have it saves so much yeah. time so yeah, it's it would, one of it, those little yeah. things that you all, can save all time. the things yeah it wouldn't even have to be just what you consider homesteading stuff it could be your craft stuff your just whatever you're doing yeah anything yeah. just herbs whatever. Um, kids seeds. kids winter clothing packed away in the summer right. summer clothing in the winter and you can put it in a tote and dig it out when you need it and yeah absolutely yeah. I and can you see can that say being... i have this one it'll let you tell you where i mean it lets you put where you have it so you could have it in the attic you could have it in the garage mm -hmm. you could have it in the basement you could have it in the, a spare room it lets you label exactly where that's at so it's yeah. just and the nice part, too, is you can search it when you're not home. You can say, okay, yeah, well, do absolutely. I have these screws or don't I? Yeah. So, yeah. I did. There was something else that I think we kind of skipped over, but I was also thinking about all your um, preservation tools. Like, now, this yeah. is something, though, that you may not actually have in the winter. It might be something you might actually have to do more like in the spring because a lot of your stuff's full right now. So like your canning jars and your oh, lids yeah. and your rings, and having all that stuff cleaned and organized and put in a place. But like I said, a lot of that stuff's actually full right now, so it might not be the best time to do that. Yeah. But it is one of them tools for your kitchen and for your preserving that at some point you want to do that with, you know, get that stuff cleaned and organized and ready to go. But more towards the end of winter. Yeah, uh, I mean, probably you can better that, time for that. Um, you can check all of your like even canning stuff. It's a great time. Once I'm still canning. Inv inventory. Yeah. Inventory. Yeah. Like, do I need more lids? Do I need more? Well, and yeah. even like my canners this year. I had to buy a new seal, which can mm. take months. Yeah, go the, through at, them right and... now with everything going on. Um, it took me, I think, six or eight weeks to get a new seal. Mm -hmm. But I noticed mine was starting to get old. Um, you can take your canner in and get it calibrated. Yeah. You know, all that kind weights, of stuff that's yeah. better to do now than when you need it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. You know, just, order new parts, different so, canners. So and many things. Parts. Yeah. And 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 again, and, we're we're definitely in that mentality. You know, repair, fix, you know, right. maintain instead of replace it, you know. There's a time. Well, some of that for canning equipment is as much as a power saw. You yeah. Know? It's you crazy. Get a new All American, yeah. it's like stuff five, is experience, it's expensive. Expensive. Yeah. And if you're gonna be, you know, part of homesteading, I feel like is frugality and 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 using yep. things wisely. And uh, if you know how to repair, you take the time to repair and maintain and clean the store so you don't lose things. You know, I mean, I've bought things that I thought I lost and then I found it a month later. You know, I thought, well, I don't know what happened to that. I must have loaned it out. And then a month later, I find it somewhere and I already bought another one, you know, because I didn't know where it was. Um, just you can you can definitely be a lot more frugal if you just. Well, and some of this some stuff, you know, you keep it maintained. You can pass it down generations. My I have three canners. Two of them were from my mother-in-law. My mother-in-law's in her mid 80s. <laughs> and my canners are from the 1950s and 60s. But because yep. they were maintained and you can buy parts for them still, I'm still using them. 
Yeah. So, you know, Great. some yeah. of these things you can maintain and pass down for generations. So. Yep. It just, yeah. uh, there's probably a lot bigger list, but there's things that you have that we don't have. And there are things that you just have to think about, you know, look at through your entire, you know, list of tools and equipment and whatever you have and say, is there anything in here that needs maintained, cleaned, purchased, re replaced, you know, or whatever. I mean, right. just go down the list and see what you have. And everybody has different things, different hobbies, different equipment for different things. So just see what you need and, and how it, how best to take care of it. And this is a great time. This is a great time to really be thinking about that and start maybe set aside a weekend and just say, this weekend is going to be for this. And we're going to make this yeah. happen and just, and just do it. And uh, I, I think it's just a wise thing to do. So we will have all the links in the show notes, the, the tools we mentioned, some supplies, uh, some YouTube videos, some, so you got a Wikipedia in here for the shadow board. We have a lot of links in here. So yeah, can... in case I didn't explain it well enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's probably, yeah, it probably just shows the pictures. I, I think it's, yeah, it's yeah. not real difficult, but I think, you know, people can get some ideas of what you're talking about if they need to. But yeah, go check those out. And um, yeah, if, if there's anything in there that maybe you want a little more information on, you can find it in the show notes. So head on over there and get that information. You can find Rachel's information and her blog at rewilderlife.com rewilderlife.com you can find what i'm writing and talking about at redemptionpermaculture.com and uh yeah check things out there uh rachel's been more faithful about blogging lately than i have been i'm trying the to last do few one here and there been, <laughs> the last few weeks have been slim but i'm working on some today so yeah yeah, yeah. I'm, i gotta get back in the mode here it's been a couple weeks since i've been really hitting that hard but i need to get back at doing that because there's lots of stuff i've got some ideas to write on and i need to, i got a list i just got to get to writing so yeah. i gotta get back on that but uh yeah check those out check Check out that. If you're not a member of the Homestead Front Porch Facebook group, uh, look that up on Facebook, uh, Homestead Front Porch. There's two questions you got to answer yes to, and you're in. And uh, it's a great group. Getting a lot more interaction in there lately. Uh, yeah. Been some great, great folks bringing up some great topics, lots of stuff being shared. Um, I really enjoyed the, uh, the 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 meal pictures around Thanksgiving, all the all the yeah, goodies. That, that was fun. fun to look at and made me hungry. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there will be a there, – there's just – you know, when garden season gets here, there's all kinds of great information popping up. And it's just a great, it's a great group, great people, and a lot of great information being shared in there. So come be a part of it and uh, be a contributor and and receiver of, of everything going on there. It's good stuff. So, um, yeah, anything else you got, Rachel? Um, I think that's it for this week. All right, folks. Uh, happy homesteading. God bless. Have a great week. And grow where you're planted. Looking around, I find the sea. I think I need a change. The rat race, I want to flee. My world, I'll rearrange. I'm getting back to the roots of how it's meant to be. Growing gardens, picking fruit, racing livestock, living free. It's a Like grandma did, sitting on her front porch, hunting and fishing like a kid. Once you've done all of your chores.